Amen. Find in the New Testament, the book of 1 Thessalonians. We are studying 1 Thessalonians on Sunday nights. And if you would, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We finally come to chapter 3. Tonight we're about halfway through our study. I believe it will take us about 12 messages to get through the book of 1 Thessalonians. And tonight is message number 6 in a study I've entitled, The Irresistible Church. That's the kind of church we see here in Thessalonica. The Irresistible Church. These people provide an example of a church that loved the Lord, a church that cared for the community of believers, and a church that impacted its surrounding area. And that's the kind of church that God has called us to be as well. A church that loves the Lord, a church that cares for one another, and a church that impacts its community. That's the way church ought to be. We come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. In fact, we'll deal with all 13 verses tonight, the entire chapter, and uh, I want to I want to talk to you about the subject tonight, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, begin reading with me in verse 1. Paul writes, Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother, God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith. That no one be moved by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass, and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, And has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all of our distress and affliction, we've been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God. As we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Remember the power of is in the Word of God. I remember learning the hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, at Second Baptist Church as a little boy. I always thought it was funny, in the red church, the red carpet building, you know, the old sanctuary, when Brother Gary would stand up and say, I want you to stand up, and we're going to sing, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. There were occasions, and you can correct me later tomorrow in staff meeting if I'm wrong, but I believe, if memory serves me correctly, there were certain times, maybe it was during the offering on Sunday morning, it could have been on a Sunday evening, but I distinctly remember a moment where we would sit down and sing a hymn. We would stand up for the first couple of songs, and sometimes when we sang the third song, we would remain seated. And I distinctly remember one Sunday, because I thought it was funny, Brother Gary said, you may remain seated as we sing Stand up, stand up for Jesus. So I didn't know what to do as about a 9 or 10 year old boy. You know, stand up or sit down. In my heart I was standing up, but outside I was sitting down. You know what I'm saying? But what does that song mean, right? What does it mean to stand up for Jesus? Well, what it means is to stand up for the truth. To stand up against false teaching. And to stand firm in our faith. And this is what Paul encourages the Thessalonian believers to do. That they are to stand up, firm in their faith, against false teachers for the sake of the gospel. You you know as well as I do, before a child can learn to walk, he or she must learn to stand. Before they can learn to take steps, they must learn how to stand. And this is what Paul is encouraging the believers in Thessalonica to do. You've got to stand firm in your faith. I can remember when our fourth child, Sadie, was very, very little. One of the things that amazed us about her is she could go from sitting down, crisscross applesauce, 
just at like a six-month-old almost, it seemed, to all of a sudden standing straight up. She never had to push against anything. She could just be sitting with her legs crossed and all of a sudden stand up, and then she'd boop, plop right back down. That was her practicing, getting ready to walk. It was, it was really interesting. We've got pictures and we've got video. What you'll notice is children, when they begin to learn how to stand, is normally they'll kind of grab onto something, they'll pull up, they'll let go for a little while, and then maybe they'll fall down, and then maybe they'll stay up a little longer, and then maybe they'll fall down until one day they can stand on their own. One day they can put one foot in front of the other, and then you're telling them, stop, don't go there, don't do that. That's the way it is with kids. And Paul was a spiritual parent to these children, to these believers. Paul was like a father exhorting and encouraging these spiritual children to stand firm in their faith. In the first two chapters of First Thessalonians, Paul explains how the church was born, how the church was nurtured. And now in chapter 3, he's telling them how to take the next steps in faith and in maturity how they ought to stand. And there's a key word in verse 2 as well as in verse 13. The key word in this chapter is establish. Paul says that you may be established in your faith. That you may be firm, standing firm, established in your faith. And I would say the key verse in this chapter is verse 8. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. Paul explains how his desire is to help these believers stand up for Jesus. Let's see how we are to stand. First of all, we stand with the Word of God as your foundation. You stand with the Word of God as your foundation. Now, we see this in the previous chapter, chapter 2, in verses 13 to 20. And I include this. Because I want us to remember the context as what, what Paul has been saying to these believers. And if you'll notice, the very first word of chapter 3 is the word therefore. You circle that word in your Bible and you know Sunday nights, the advanced Bible class, right? You know anytime you see the word therefore in scripture, you have to stop and ask yourself the question, what is it there for? Because it always points to something that came before it. It always points to something preceding that verse. And in this context, Paul has been encouraging the believers. He's been challenging the Thessalonians to stand firm on the Word of God. This word links chapter 3 to the context of chapter 2. What is he saying? Paul reminds them in chapter 2 that they received the Word and accepted it. Received means to take it. Accepted means they welcomed it in. They received it with gladness, chapter 2 and verse 13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. Not as the Word of men, but as what it really is, the Word of God, which is at work in you believers. Paul is saying, you received and welcomed the Word of God as a foundation for your spiritual lives. And can I remind you tonight, believers in Christ, a working knowledge of the Word of God is absolutely necessary if we are going to mature in our faith. If we are going to grow as believers in Jesus Christ, we have to study the Word of God, learn and grow through the text of Scripture and the Holy Spirit of God applying it to our lives. The Bible tells us the Word of God is like spiritual food that nourishes us. It's like a light that brightens our path. It's like a weapon that can defend us. It is our sure foundation. The Word of God provides a foundation for the believers in Jesus Christ. And one reason God has established local churches throughout our community, throughout our nation, and across the globe is so that believers can gather together and study the powerful, perfect Word of God. This transforms us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 6, it's interesting. Paul, th Paul says here the Thessalonian believers were imitators of him and imitators of the Lord. Why were they imitators of Paul and imitators of the Lord? Chapter 1 and verse 6, do you know why? Look at what it says. Because they received the word in much affliction. How could they walk like Christ in faith and obedience? Because they received the word of God even in the midst of pain and suffering. They not only learned it, 
they applied it. They not only heard it, they weren't just hearers, they were doers of the word. I heard about a man in New York City who died at the age of 63, 63 years old, and he never had one job. He spent his entire life, his entire adult life in college. And during those years, he acquired multiple degrees. There were so many degrees it looked like he had an alphabet after his name. He spent his entire adult life in college never having a job. Why would anyone want to do that? Why did this man spend his entire adult life in college? Because when he was a child, a wealthy relative of his passed away and left this man a large sum of money with one stipulation. As long as he was in school, he would receive enough money to supply everything he needed to live. But once he finished school, the money would stop. So this man discovered a technicality. All he had to do was continue going to school. If he continued going to school, he would get all the money he needed to live and to survive. He had a steady income for the rest of his life. Unfortunately, he spent thousands of hours listening to professors, thousands of hours reading books, thousands of hours studying and sitting in class, but not once ever doing what he learned or applying what he had read. This man is very much like many believers who sit under the teaching of the Word of God or study the Word of God or learn the Word of God or maybe even memorize the Word of God, but they never do what the Word says. We ought to apply the teachings of Scripture. Here in the church of Thessalonica, they not only received the Word, they welcomed it, they accepted it. It's interesting to note this little book, the letter of Paul to the church of Thessalonica is chock full of theological truth. This little book touches almost every major doctrine of the New Testament church. It deals over a dozen times with God the Father and God the Son. It deals approximately four times with God the Holy Spirit. It deals with sin. It deals with salvation. It deals with ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. It deals with the work of ministry and believers using their spiritual gifts. It deals with the doctrine of the last things. Since Paul did not remain in Thessalonica very long, it's amazing to me all the stuff he packs into just a few chapters, five chapters, right here in this one little book. Paul is saying, I want you to learn. I want you to grow I want you to know the truth but most of all we learn in order to do what good is it to have a mind full of the truth of scripture but a heart that doesn't obey it we learn in order to grow we learn to apply and to do so we stand with the with the word of God as our foundation secondly we stand with the people of God with the people of God to help you move forward one of the ways we are able to stand against persecution or affliction, as Paul says here, to stand firm in the faith is because there are people of God around us to strengthen us. The people of God gather together to encourage us to godliness. We ought to spur one another on to good works and godliness. You know, when we were at the lake just Last week with family and friends a couple of weeks ago, I cooked on a charcoal grill. Normally, I know some of you think it's the only manly thing to do to cook on a charcoal grill. I understand that. But normally at my house, we don't have a whole lot of time to cook on charcoal. So we just light up the gas grill and you know we'll grill some steaks or burgers or chicken or something like that. But one of the things I noticed is when, uh, when we lit the charcoal, there's this, I don't know what you call it, but there's this little thing that's got a handle on it. You put all the charcoal inside of that. It keeps the charcoal real close together. And so when the charcoal is real close together after you light it, it stays together for a while. It gets really, 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 really hot because it stays close together. And then once it's been close together and got really, really hot, you spread it out and then you can cook on the grill. It's interesting, the moment you spread it out, the heat from the charcoal begins to dissipate. It starts to go away. When you get it together, it keeps feeding off each other. It's hotter and hotter and hotter. When it spreads out, guess what? You want charcoal to go out, just spread it out and leave it out. And here's what I thought. When believers gather together, 
in the context of corporate worship. Man, it's like that charcoal. We get together, we ought to feed off each other. We ought to be encouraging one another. Our faith ought to grow strong. We ought to grow hotter. Our temperature ought to increase. We ought to be more encouraged in our faith. Then we spread out into the world. And yes, sometimes our temperature might decrease a little bit. But then guess what we get to do? We get to come back and gather together again and, and, and warm up a little bit at the fire of devotion, at the word of God, at singing songs to the Lord, at fellowshipping with believers. And then we spread out again to go, to go make a difference in the world. This is what God has called us to do. And this is how believers ought to encourage and strengthen one another. Believers ought to help us grow in our faith. This is what Paul says in verses 1 through 8. The people of God ought to spur us on to godliness. This is why church is so important. This is why we ought to gather with the body of Christ. This is why when you miss it, you ought to miss it. You know what I mean? You ought to miss when you're not with the people of God. Notice several things we see in verses 1 through 8. First of all, we see concern. Paul had a great concern for their welfare, for their faithfulness. Verse 5, he says, he, he, verse 1 and verse 5. In verse 1, he says, man, I, had to, I was left in Athens alone. In fact, I sent Timothy to come check on you. I was so worried about you. I told Timothy, hey, don't worry about me and what I've got going on. You go check on the Thessalonian believers. You go make sure that they're okay. He says in verse 5, I couldn't even bear it any longer. Even though he's facing his own trials, he's more concerned about those believers in Thessalonica and their well-being in the midst of trials and difficulty. Concern, not only concern, but compassion. Verses 2 and 3. It's one thing to be concerned about a situation. It's an entirely different thing to show compassion. Concern may be emotion or feelings. Or compassion is emotion in action. Compassion is moved to do something based on that concern. Compassion born of love motivated Paul to send Timothy back to the Thessalonian believers. And the Bible says to, ex to exhort and to establish them concerning their faith. Paul mentions that five times in this section alone. That they might grow in their faith. Concern, compassion. Then he talks about conflict, trials, and testings that they faced. Multiple times in this section, he talks about how they suffer affliction, how they suffer persecution. I want you to understand, church, listen carefully. Paul recognized and told them ahead of time that they would encounter suffering as a result of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trials and testings come to Christians not as accidents, but as appointments. Do you understand that? They are divine appointments God uses to grow and to strengthen us. The Bible says here we must expect to suffer for the sake of the Lord. Persecution is not foreign to the believer. It's a normal part of the Christian life. Paul had repeatedly told them, you will suffer. And so here he says, just as I told you, you have suffered. And he suffered as well. Conflict, not only that, but then verse 6 and 7, comfort. Paul was grateful that Timothy could report back to him concerning the church at Thessalonica. And look at what he says in verse 6 and verse 7. Now, now Timothy's come back to Paul after, after checking on the church. And look what he says in verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all of our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. Paul had heard that they were faithfully following the Lord. Paul received word from Timothy that they were consistent in their love and devotion. Paul had learned that just like he loved them and longed to see them, they loved him and longed to see him as well. And not only did he hear that, but one of the best things that a pastor or spiritual father can hear. In verse 6 and verse 7, he brings us the good news of your faith, of your love, of your devotion to Christ. The greatest news a pastor, a fellow believer, a father, a mother, a friend can receive. Third John, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. This is what Paul says on behalf now of these believers. He sees that they're walking in faithfulness, and it is indeed encouraging to him. It gives life to him, comfort, and then confidence, verse 8. 
confidence. Notice what he says here in verse 8. He has great confidence in their faith. He's grateful for their service to the Lord. Let's read verse 8 together. Look what it says. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. This is the key verse to the entire chapter. This is the theme of, of the chapter indeed. And in fact, much of this book can be summed up in 1 Thessalonians 3, 8. This is where we find life, that you are walking faithful and standing firm in your faith in Christ. Incredible. He says that you are standing fast in the Lord. Do you know that's a military term? To stand fast means to hold your ground without retreat, no matter the onslaught of the enemy In the face of the attack to stand up, they're standing fast. They're strong in their faith. He was delighted. And you know what he did as a result? He encouraged them to continue. Other believers gathered together to help us grow in our faith. I can remember when I was a freshman at the University of Georgia, I felt a little bit like a fish out of water. I had grown up here at Second Baptist Church. I'd grown up in Warner Robins, and I was never one of those kids that wanted to grow up and get gone. I mean, you know the kids that just like can't wait to leave, can't wait to get out of town, can't wait to go move somewhere else. I was always the kid that wanted to stay in Warner Robins, but University of Georgia was in Athens. You know, I was always the kid that that wouldn't mind coming back and look how God brought me back many years later and that's such a joy. But I can remember my first few months in Athens. Uh, It was difficult. And I can remember one morning I was just opening my Bible and I was reading and I, I opened a As I was reading through 1 Thessalonians, I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 1. And Paul wrote, you know, we could bear it no longer. We were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And I was like, Lord, that's me. I've been left behind in Athens alone. I felt all alone in Athens, you know, for my my whole first semester and almost my entire first year, you know. I wasn't the guy going downtown where everybody else was going or doing everything else everybody else was doing. Athens, boy, I'm a Georgia Bulldog, but that's a wicked place, you know. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. And I can remember feeling like I'd been left alone. And it wasn't until that next year when I became a student pastor at the age of 19 at Central Baptist Church in Athens, Georgia, that I began to feel that connection and that community. You know what I was missing? I was missing that fellowship of believers. Not, not that I didn't go to church when I was there, but I found a sense of purpose and calling where God had me serve. Starting as a youth pastor at the age of 19, I found that connection among the body of Christ. That encouraged me. I didn't feel like I was alone anymore. And that's what this is about. Like when we gather together as followers of Christ, we can come together and be reminded you're not by yourself out in this wicked world. God's got so many others who've not bowed a knee to Baal. He has so many others that are faithful and good and true. And we come together to remind each other of God's goodness and that we will be faithful. Paul's encouraged by that. We ought to be as well. We have the Word of God as our foundation. The people of God to help us move forward with the power of prayer to strengthen your faith. With the power of prayer to strengthen your faith, there's a phenomenal prayer in verses 9 through 13. This is one of Paul's pastoral prayers for his people. The Bible tells us Paul's praying was constant. It was fervent. He interceded, notice the phrase, night and day. That doesn't just mean in the morning and in the evening. It gives the idea, the indication it was all the time. And the Bible uses the phrase most earnestly. Remember, I've told you, the word of God and prayer go together. How do we know what to pray? The word of God provides the guide rails. The word of God provides the lines. It is the road map by which we are to pray. And so sometimes we pray, we ask amiss when we ask, not according to the will of God and not according to the word of God. But how do we know how to pray? The word of God and prayer go hand in hand. In fact, if you're struggling for words to pray... You don't exactly know what you ought to pray. I'd encourage you to open up the scriptures. Sometimes Psalms is a great place to start. And begin praying scripture. And watch how God begins to to open up your, your own prayer life. The word of God and prayer. And here, Paul talks about prayer. He's praying for them. He begins his his prayer, and 
really prays their faith would be strengthened. Now, there's a sermon right here alone. And in fact, just a, a little while ago when I preached a series, Great Prayers of the Bible, I preached this text of Scripture, 1 Thessalonians 3, 9 to 13. It was a sermon entitled, Praying for People Who Are Facing Hard Times. But I want you to notice Paul prays three specific things. He prays that their, that their uh, faith would advance. He says that, that God would supply what's lacking in your faith. He prays that their love would abound. Look at what he says in verse 12. That, and, and make the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. And he prays that their hope would abide. Faith, hope, and love. He prays that their faith would advance, that their love would abound, that their hope would abide. He says that, that we will stand before God the Father and that we will stand blameless in his sight. This is a powerful prayer. That prayer would would strengthen their faith, that it would serve as a, a, as a support and encouragement to them. You want power in your Christian life, you must be a person of prayer. There are no shortcuts. If you want to be a strong, solid, faithful believer, be a person of prayer. Prayer sinks your roots down deep into the richness of the soil of the Word of God. And prayer, long, enduring, faithful prayer, gives you a strength and support like you really could never dream or imagine. Dr. Alexander McLaren was one of the greatest and clearest Bible expositors of his age. In fact, I have almost an entire section of a shelf dedicated to Dr. McLaren's sermons. He was a wonderful expositor of Scripture. Someone asked him one time, what is the secret to your success? And here's what he said. He owed all that was in his self, his ministry, and everything to the habit, never broken, spending one hour a day of what he said was time alone with the eternal. The hour he took every day from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. In fact, there was a pastoral assistant who he would allow in the room on occasion. Never a word was to be spoken. That pastoral assist assistant said McLaren would sit right there in his chair with his Bible on his lap. And sometimes he would read the pages, but more frequently he just sat there with his hand over his face, spending time in the presence of God. And McLaren was clear that when he was in the Word from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., it was never for any type of sermon. It was never for any type of lecture or message. During that time, he wasn't trying to find a sermon. He was just as a son reading a love letter from his father. He was just learning and spending time in the presence of God. And McLaren says, that is the greatest thing that I ever did in my ministry. Spending time with God. Paul's prayer teaches us how to pray not only for, for new believers, but for all believers. How, how ought we to pray? 1 John 3, 3, that every man has this hope in him, in Christ. He purifies himself even as he is pure. That our hope brings purity. We ought to be holy and blameless before the Father. How do we stand? We stand with the Word of God as our foundation. The people of God around us help us move forward the power of prayer to strengthen our faith and finally you can stand with the promise of God to secure your future the very last phrase the last verse of this chapter so we're going to stand before God so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before God the Father notice that phrase at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints you see that at the coming of the Lord Jesus with all of his saints. He ends 1 Thessalonians 2 with a reminder that Jesus Christ is coming soon, that we will stand before him. What is our hope? What is our, our joy? What is our glory, our crown at the coming of the Lord Jesus? It is you, the body of Christ, the believers. And here he says again, verse 13, so that you may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before God our Father. At the coming of the Lord Jesus, 
with all of his saints. He prays that believers in Jesus Christ might stand before him holy and blameless and righteous when Christ returns. Listen carefully. How are we made holy and righteous and blameless in the sight of God? It is only through the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us. It is only through the righteousness of Christ imputed to us that we are made holy and righteous in his sight and we are made acceptable before a holy God. We stand established blameless, righteous. D. Campbell Morgan said, I believe the promises of God enough to venture an eternity on them. I believe it. Robert Murray McShane wrote, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies, yet distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. He ever lives to make intercession. This is the promise of God. It is enough to secure your future. It is enough to guarantee eternity. We have the promise of God. And that helps us stand. To to conclude, I think it's important for us to ask this question. Am I standing firm or am I falling flat? Am I standing firm? Or am I falling flat? Have I been faithful to Christ in in my Christian walk? Or am I constantly falling prey to the enemy and to sin? And if I find that I'm constantly falling prey to temptation or succumbing to the enemy's plots and plans in my life, then something is missing. And I need to stand with the Word of God as my foundation, with the people of God gathered around me consistently and faithfully, with the power of prayer to strengthen me, the promise of God that secures my future so that I might be established, so that I might stand firm in the faith. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. He stood for you. It's worth it. 